uh, first, we are greatly honored that you've decided and you've, you've uh, agreed to be interviewed in this series. Uh, as you know, we're, we're interviewing a number of scholars in the field of China Christianity studies. And we were particularly um, eager to interview you in particular because yes. of your contribution in a way, it, it actually matches perfectly what, what we think of as this new field, China Christianity studies especially your own publication and your work in the history of the Jesuit enterprise in, in late imperial China. Yes. And, you know, most of us who in the field have read your work, most of us, you know, we started many years ago reading Kongzi and or Confucius. I think you published that in something like 1989. And of course, now we're all enthralled because of your work that you're, you're, you're completing in collaboration with Claudia von Coloni. Of course, the, the translation of this monumental act of Pekinensia. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, you know, we've also read a number of your, your articles, uh, your book chapters. Uh, it's just an enormous list of publication. And the, the goal really is to let you do the speaking. But uh, we also just took note that recently there was a book launch of your recent act of Pekinensia volume at Campion Hall at Oxford. And those of us in the field of China Christianity studies heard a great deal about how there was such excitement there at Oxford that that book came out. Um, but yes. in any case, so, so my goal is to ask you questions. So let me just start with the first question. Uh, Professor Rule, the first sort of question, we're, of course, you know we're asking every scholar the same question, but if you could reflect upon what brought you to the field of China Christianity studies, and maybe if you would add to that, uh, what attracted you to the particular areas about what, which you've researched? Well, thinking about it, when I was preparing for this interview, uh, in a way, China was inev inevitable for me, but I never understood that until I was well in, engaged in it. I mean, I'm Australian to start with. Born just before the Second World War, so my early experiences were of an Australia at war in the Pacific and China and Japan and so on, featured very much in my earliest recollections, my relatives serving in the services and so on. And so I had that sort of connection with China. Um, and another connection, which was China missionary connection, which didn't, uh, at the time I didn't realize was significant, but it was, um, we live very near the headquarters of the Australian branch of the Columban Fathers, whose missions were primarily in China. And uh, my father, strangely, played tennis with the, uh, the priests and student priests at, at, uh, at the uh, Columban College. And so I often accompanied him and I was allowed up into their attic. And in the attic, they had their Chinese memorabilia so at a very early age, I was exposed to a model of a Chinese village, for example, um, Chinese art, Chinese Christian art too, which was interesting, and all sorts of bits and pieces, which certainly caught my imagination. Uh, I didn't really associate it with missions to China, but China. So I had that interest in China, but um, it largely faded away. Um, and uh, when I left, well, perhaps I should say the other thing was, of course, the, the Red China, the China menace, which uh, loomed so large during my later secondary school days. And uh, I took an interest in what was happening in China. And amongst those things were, of course, the expulsion of the missionaries and, and so on. So I was, I was well aware of that. And then when I left school, I decided to join the Jesuits. China didn't enter into that in the slightest. It was, um, I was attracted by various things that I knew. I suppose Sir Francis Xavier and so on, I was aware of that, but uh, I didn't enter the Jesuits to be a missionary. That certainly wasn't part of my, my thinking. Um, uh, I, after a few years, we, I parted from the Jesuits quite amicably. <laughs> for, you know, personal reasons, I decided just wasn't what I wanted to do. Although some of the things that I'd done in my studies with Jesuits, and also when I uh, 
I had a two years teaching in the Jesuit College in Sydney and I taught history, senior history there. And that included uh, teaching Chinese history, which I hadn't really uh, done anything about. Um, I'd broken my university studies. I started when I was still a Jesuit and uh, they had a desperate need for teachers one year. And so they said, we'll take a break and go off and teach. So I went to Sydney. It was a great experience. It was a lovely school overlooking the harbour and all the rest of it. And I enjoyed myself there and I enjoyed the kids. I enjoyed teaching. But I, as I said, strangely was asked, would I teach a, a, a final year course, which was on, on Chinese history? So I did. And I sort of mugged it up from, from scratch and had a vague interest in it. But uh, when I went back to Melbourne University to finish off my honours degree in history, I, that was after I'd left the Jesuits, I um, was convinced that uh, I was going to be a medievalist. I loved medieval history. And there were some very inspiring medievalists at Melbourne University at that, that time. And uh, of course, I had good Latin from my ecclesiastical studies. Um, and uh, then in my third year, I had to do a filling course. You had to do something sort of different from your mainstream. And there was a course that had just started to be offered called Far Eastern History. And I thought, oh, well, I might as well do that. And I was hooked well and truly. And also um, hooked by the, the inspiring teacher of Jack Gregory, who had just come back from London University, where he'd done a doctorate on modern Chinese history. And uh, suddenly I did a, a change around. But of course that meant I was thinking of graduate studies and uh, it meant that if I was going to go into Chinese history, I had to get Chinese language in addition to my Latin and French and uh, a smattering of some other Romance languages. So um, uh, I did and uh, I started to learn Chinese and I had three years after graduating in, from my honours degree in history at Melbourne University where I was a tutor, which meant I had an income and was able to get married too, by the way, but uh, I could continue my studies of Chinese. Um, and then I went to the ANU, Australian National University, to do my doctoral studies. Um, I had intended to work under Igor de Rakevils. I'd met him and I knew that he'd been a student of Pasquale de Lear, the Jesuit who uh, wrote the great edition of the Fonti Ricciani, Ricci's works. Um, but there was an, an administrative switch over at the ANU the, just as I arrived and I was put in another department. Um, Igor remained a great inspirer of my work, talking about the ex-missionaries that he'd known in Rome. Despite his name, he was a Roman born and bred, um, and uh, a Mongolist, by the way, too. But um, uh, he knew a great deal about the Jesuit mission in China, and he was a great inspiration to me. My supervisor, uh, f formal supervisor, was Otto van der Sprinkel, who was a... Um, a China specialist, uh, mostly Chinese administrative and economic history, uh, but Otto um, was also a, <laughs> a multi-skilled man, had all sorts of interests. He was a Quaker, very active in religious uh, activities, mm -hmm. and uh, he and I were amongst the founders of the Canberra Society for the Study of Religions, and I started to think of uh, religious studies with a China specialization as being what I really ought to go into. Um, of course, to do my doctoral thesis on the Jesuit interpretation of Confucianism, uh, I had to go to the archives in Rome. I chose it, by the way, uh, almost by accident. I had my real interest at that stage was more in modern China, contemporary China. I was fascinated by Red China, by Mao Zedong and so on. Um, but um, in my China course, Chinese course at Melbourne University, it was very much modern China, no classical. And I desperately had to get some classical Chinese if I was to work on the Jesuit sources. Um, 
And so I mainly did classical Chinese while I was doing my graduate studies. And then in the middle year of my graduate studies, I spent a year overseas in the archives. They didn't know what to do with me at the ANU. They had a regular system of stipends for people to do field work. And I said, my field work is to go and work in archives and libraries in Europe. And they said, oh, but, but you're in Asian studies, you know, we don't know how to handle you. So eventually they gave me a sum of money and said, go off for a year. <laughs> and uh, I did. But that year, of course, was mostly spent in Rome. And uh, uh, suddenly I realized what treasures there were for general Chinese history in those Jesuit archives in Rome and the Vatican Library and um, Propaganda Fide archives and so on. I mean, so much that I was just overwhelmed with it. And um, my thesis topic, I deliberately chose as one that would was cross-cultural. In other words, I could use all my European languages and add as much Chinese as I was capable of adding to do it. Um, and that worked. And uh, so uh, I got stuck on uh, studying the, uh, the Jesuits in China and became fascinated. I, strangely, my Jesuit background had very little to do with that. That wasn't really I didn't do it because they were Jesuits. I did it because I, I realized that here was a cross-cultural topic where there was a great deal of material in European languages and Chinese language to, to match it. And the Jesuit interpretation of Confucianism was a, an appropriate um, subject to take, but it was one that opened up in all sorts of directions, both general Chinese history the whole question of cultural interchange and influence and so on, especially in the pre-imperialist uh, era. Um, and also um, the um, real contacts that were made between Chinese scholars and Jesuit scholars who were um, people who were as well educated as you could be in the European uh, culture and and studies, but were groping their way into a totally alien and different uh, society. And I was fascinated by people like Ritchie, who had achieved a real rapport with China and Chinese. And uh, so uh, that was how I, I got launched into, into uh, that area. When I came back to um, Melbourne, I taught at Melbourne University, um, taught Chinese history, oh, Far Eastern history they, it was when I took it over because uh, Jack Gregory had brought back uh, uh, a London University <laughs> uh, approach to the, the whole thing, looking out the Far East. I said, it's not our Far East in Australia, it's our near North. So uh, uh, I uh, uh, changed the title to East Asian history. <laughs> and. Uh, Jack Gregory, by the way, had meanwhile transferred to La Trobe University, one of the foundation professors there. Uh, so I took over his course, but but reshaped it a little bit in a in a, a, a different direction. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, I began my teaching career, which was a combination of religious studies and Chinese history. And right through, although my formal attachment was sometimes religious studies, sometimes history, uh, that's what I did. I taught courses in Chinese religion and philosophy. I taught courses in other aspects of religion, like Australian Aboriginal religion. Um, when we started teaching religious studies at La Trobe, a lot of people said, we should be teaching Australian Aboriginal religion. And I said, well, I can't teach it. Now got nobody who can. Our early appointments were all in other areas. And finally, they said, well, you should take it on. So I did. So I had a sort of second string to my bow beside China. It was Aborigines. And I've kept an interest in that ever since, but not published very much in it. I, I felt that I really had to have 
focused on that much more if I was to to publish on it. But I enjoyed teaching it, and I think my students enjoyed learning about it. Um, and I taught uh, Chinese history, which was mostly modern Chinese history, because that's what the students wanted to do. Uh, but of course, uh, you could regard the Jesuit, the early Jesuit period, late Ming, early Qing, as the beginning of modern Chinese history. So I always started a little bit earlier than than the students really wanted to do. Um, so uh, that my teaching career was was that a combination of religious studies with a specialization in China and um, history with a specialization in 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 uh, modern Chinese history. Um, so uh, yes. So this is a th that answer provides a rich tapestry uh, from the Columbans and their attic to the Jesuits to uh, to to Rome to an interest in Chairman Mao um, and what what really struck me too is that I I recall. Uh, as I wrote my first book, which was, of course, I, I like you, didn't expect to study, uh, you know, China Christianity studies. I thought I would be a Han Dynasty scholar. Otto van der Sprenkel's yeah. work was near my elbow uh, for the first several years of my own academic life. Um, but, but, uh, but, you know, you mentioned your archival work, and you mentioned a lot of uh, the, the sort of the trajectories that brought you into Latin, into classical Chinese, uh, into European languages. I wonder, Professor Rule, if you might uh, have had a research discovery uh, in your life as a scholar that made you think differently about your topic. Well, of course, I spent a lot of my early years when I could get away from, from Melbourne um, in archives in Rome in particular, and constantly I made discoveries there. I can't think of any that stands out from the others, but it was a, a process of constantly fitting in bits of the jigsaw, as it were. And certainly I acquired a great love of archival work. There's nothing like having in your hands a document from 300 years ago uh, relating to the man you're writing about and so on, or by the man you're writing about. And in that um, uh Chinese, black Chinese ink, which hasn't faded over the years and so on. Um, I find nowadays, of course, when there's so much more material available electronically, uh, too much, really. I mean, it's overwhelming. Uh, but also, it's not quite the same seeing seeing the thing on a screen as, as it is sitting actually holding in your hands or in a bound volume the the um, uh, the writing of the of the per person you you're dealing with and uh, that was very important but um, in if there was a eureka experience in my uh, research it was not in archives but it was in the tea room at the Australian National University on a visit there uh, when I ran into that extraordinary lady, Audrey Donathorne. Uh, Audrey was research professor in Chinese economics. And uh, I quickly found that she was a China enthusiast of the first order. Um, she'd been born the child of a missionary in Sichuan and uh, an evangelical Anglican missionary uh, and she always described mm. herself as Sichuanese if you asked what what a nationality was she'd say I'm Sichuanese <laughs> um, then she was converted to Catholicism and became an ardent supporter of Chinese Catholicism at a time when it was at its lowest ebb to the extent that she was banned from visiting China because she constantly tried to make contact with Chinese Catholics and so on at a very bad time for that but um, Audrey said to me, why are you studying missionaries and not the Chinese Christians? And that really struck home. I, I thought, well, she, no, she's right. <laughs> the Chinese Christians are at the heart of this thing if you're dealing with, with Chinese Christianity. And um, 
that uh, push that she gave me has been important to me ever since. Not that I don't mainly use missionary sources, but I'm constantly asking myself, what can you find from these sources uh, about the Chinese Christians themselves? And of course, fortunately, in this case, um, in my period in the uh, early Qing period, late Ming, early Qing, we do have a lot of writings in Chinese by Chinese Christian scholar converts. And I've done a lot of work on those. And uh, uh, perhaps if I'd started my career a little earlier, if I'd had that insight earlier, I might have focused much more on that than, than I've had perforce to do. My Chinese has never been as good as I would like it to be. <laughs> and uh, although my classical Chinese is a good deal better than my modern Chinese, uh, it's still not scholarly um, uh, caliber, I think. However, I can plug away at it and uh, uh, I do do my best. But um, the um, that push that Audrey Donathon gave me has been very important to me. And uh, I visited Audrey often when I, in her retirement in Hong Kong. She died last week, by the way, mm. just short of her centenary. But fortunately, she published her memoirs just before she died. Oh, goodness. An extremely interesting uh, account of her constant interaction with, with Chinese Christians. She, in fact, funded a lot of publishing of um, translations of important Catholic theological works into Chinese uh, from Hong Kong. But uh, uh, she also had, um, when she was able to, started visiting China again, and uh, especially Sichuan, which was her, as I said, her, her home place. And uh, a remarkable lady, but her influence was in that regard was was important it gave me a push that uh, uh, turned me halfway through I suppose my research career in a slightly different di uh, direction it also meant that I kept on asking myself these questions about what Chinese Christian experience was lying behind this interaction with particular missionaries I found it again in my work on the Acta Pecanensia which I've been working on in my retirement um, you get the missionaries talking about the problems, but the problems are coming from the Chinese communities. And you can see sometimes it's a question of, of um, misunderstandings and misestimations of the Chinese Christians. Sometimes it's a question of trying to impose something on them that wasn't really working. Um, and uh, it's uh, certainly been a perspective that that's um, influenced me. I wrote a thing about China-centered, um, the Chinese-centered studies of, of um, uh, the Jesuit missions. Um, Chinese being the people-centered uh, aspect of it, and I think that's that's very important, and that's sort of kept me going on a lot of a lot of the projects that I've worked on over the years. So the interesting thing about that answer is, you know, you mentioned you didn't have a eureka moment, but in a way you had a redirection, a, a sort of a redirecting moment that that shifted sort of your interest more toward the uh, indigenous Chinese. And, and yes. you also mentioned something to me that I found very interesting that in your retirement, you picked, you, you began this project of the Act of Picanensia, which <laughs> is something that most of us would uh, uh, sort of consider to be uh, a, a something one would begin in in your doctoral work, <laughs> just an enormous work. But you know, I, this is the this is a question that's not on the list. But I know people want me to ask you this question, and that is, uh, you know, I, I just was looking at volume two of your translation, you and Claudia von Kalani's translation, and and certainly there's I think more there about Kangxi's point of view, and um and 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 to me that um. That is a very rich perspective to, to gain. But I think some of us want to know how reading the ACTA has changed how you think about the rights controversy. Well, I set out in my retirement to produce 
seven volumes. <laughs> what I realized would be a four volume translation of the Acta Paganensia, and I'm now halfway through the fourth and last, and a three volume history of the Chinese rites. I've long ago finished the first two volumes of the Chinese rites, but I got stuck in the era of the Detonal Mission in China, the legation, and decided, well, I'll wait until I've finished the Acta Pecanensia to finish it off. So um, those two volumes have been waiting there <laughs> for completion for a long time. But um, the thing held together, um, and the big insight I think that's come out of that project is that it's not a highly specialized esoteric area of Chinese history that coming into the China in that period from the Jesuits um, opens up all sorts of things, especially if you're working on the Jesuits at the court, because their documents uh, contain fascinating insights into events in the, um, in the court. The, famous succession struggle, which of the princes was to succeed Kang Shi, is very much illuminated by material in what will be the third volume, what is the third volume of the Acta Pecanensia. And I've been conscious of a mainstreaming of China mission studies in Sinology and in Chinese history over the last 20 years, as more and more people working on Chinese science or uh, Chinese economics or Chinese administrative history or Chinese political history realize how important this material is. I mean, it's rare that you get the men from outer space <laughs> sitting down in, in, in the place that you want to study. They've come from elsewhere, they're highly intelligent, they're well trained, and they observe and they write about it at length and uh, give a different perspective on, on what was happening. And I think in 19th century mission studies, the same thing happens, except that that um, neglected rural, remote China, the only Westerners who went into there were, were missionaries. And their records are the only Western records that you have of the, those places, sometimes the only records even. So, um, there's been a mainstreaming of, of um, China mission studies and Jesuit mission studies, which um, I wouldn't have expected when I started. I was a very rare bird. In fact, I don't know how many people said to me in my early days, you're committing a very bad career move working on the Jesuits. <laughs> Mind you, I didn't entirely work on the Jesuits. I'm, I wrote a short biography of Mao Zedong, for example, which uh, was one of my early works uh, came, coming out of my teaching. But um, um, uh, it took me a long time to realize that, um, you know, it wasn't a dead end. It wasn't, in fact, off the beat, off the main track, but was increasingly coming to be seen to be right on the main track. And... Um, uh, that's been, of course, enormously helped by the international cooperation that's occurred, firstly, with European and American and Australian scholars, although I remained practically the only person in Australia who, who was working in the field. And um, uh, that's been enabled by institutions like the Ritchie Institutes in uh, Paris, Taipei, Macau and San Francisco, and especially San Francisco. And uh, that I think would bring us to the question of, of <laughs> real outstanding special influences on my work and yes. the persons who do it. And Right. Well, that was the, uh, the, the fourth, the second to last question is if you could recall yeah. some memories that you have on other scholars. Yeah, well, I mean, a very great influence on me was Ed Malatesta, mm -hmm. Father Edward Malatesta, SJ. In 1978, I'd managed to accumulate enough 
uh, sabbatical leave to spend the whole year in Rome to really get into the archives in a way I hadn't been able to do before. And also we had two young children who were the eldest of whom was about to start school. So uh, I thought this is the, the chance to go away well, for me uh, and uh, to really get into the archives, which I did mostly in Rome, a little bit in Paris and London. But uh, halfway through that period in Rome, uh, a Jesuit friend of mine, Gerald O'Collins, who was the Dean of Theology at the Gregorian University, said, I've got a colleague who teaches biblical theology here, a Californian Jesuit called Edward Malatesta. And he's been bitten by the China bug. I said, what do you mean by that? I said, he wants to go to China. 78, it was just starting to be possible. <laughs> and uh, he said, I must introduce you. So uh, we met up at the Travy Fountain, one beautiful spring afternoon, and uh, wandered around central Rome with my two small children follow eating ice creams and so on. And Ed spilled out his soul to me. He told me he joined the Jesuits in California. He'd come over from New York, actually, where he was brought up, uh, to go to China on the Californian Jesuit China mission. 1948 was a bad time to do that. <laughs> and of course, um, he found that it was utterly impossible and was diverted into other things, became a biblical scholar. Um, and uh, quite a well-known one and published a lot of interesting works on St. John's Gospel and things like that. But he always had in his heart that he wanted to be a China missionary. Suddenly, in mid-career, this was po perhaps possible. And he told me what he was going to do, which he did. He went to do an intensive Chinese language course in, the, in California. Uh, and being Ed, he really, you know, piled it on and in a year had acquired at least a, a manageable Chinese. Did a short while further in Taiwan where he, he tried to find out how to teach theology in Chinese. Um, uh, and the Chinese Jesuits in Taiwan helped him with that. Then he went to China. Uh, what happened was what I expected would happen. <laughs> In other words, after a short while, he couldn't resist making contact with the underground church and uh, was duly thrown out. So he went back to California and teamed up with um, Frank Rouleau, who uh, was had been professor of ecclesiastical history in Shuzhou Wei in Shanghai before the Jesuits were thrown out of there and who in his enforced retirement had um, uh, gone heavily into studying the history of the Jesuits in China and accumulating an extraordinary collection of, uh, of uh, microfilm documents from mostly Roman archives uh, relating to the um, the Chinese rights controversy and uh, to the, the Tornal mission and so on. Ed became a sort of research assistant to him at Los Gatos when he came out of China through the early, um, early 80s and quickly decided that he needed to have an institutional base if anything was to come of this extraordinary amount of material that Rouleau had acquired. So, um, he shifted to the University of San Francisco, which took him on uh, as head of a research institute, which they called the Ricci Institute for Chinese Western Cultural History. And Ed got in touch with me and said, look, you know, we've, we've got this extraordinary collection of documents. Um, would you like to work on the Chinese rights controversy with, with us? And I said, yes. And so, any time I could get leave, especially summer vacations um, uh, from in the Australian uh, universities, I used to go over to, to San Francisco and 
uh, plug away at the documents. They weren't properly catalogued, and I helped catalog the the Rouleau collection. Uh, but uh, I kept on finding incredible numbers of treasures. And Ed, of course, was was the great inspiration. He he started organising things. Um, he made connections with the French Jesuits in Paris, the Rich Institute there, and they began the colloque. Uh, every three years, a big international conference in Paris, in Chantilly, and that became a great focus for my, my work. And through that, I met an increasing number of younger scholars, mostly uh, European, but also some from America, who were starting to work in this field. And that began a very fruitful international exchange. But Ed was at the very heart of that. And... Uh, um, his inspiration was 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 important. It was a sort of his his approach was of course much more, if you if you like, missionary, scholarly missionary, than uh, uh, mine would have been. But um, uh, it was still very important, and uh, he was such a great enthusiast, and he made such connections in China that. Um, uh, uh, were useful to, to me and to everybody else who was working in this field. And of course, he began that process of bringing Chinese scholars to uh, San Francisco um, and that international, that cross-cultural um, scholarly uh, interrelationship. And of course, uh, Wu Xiaoxin, who was his, his assistant, um, helped greatly in that. Um, it was a great tragedy that Ed died so young. I mean, he he burnt himself out. There's no question about about that. He had bad asthma and so on, and he finally got a year's leave. And people said to him, "You know, go off and uh, and uh, 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 recuperate." And what did he do? He went to China, <laughs> which he, he did while he was fully working. And uh, unfortunately, he had a very bad asthma attack and uh, died in Hong Kong. But um, he was a great influence on me. Uh, one other Jesuit I should mention as an influence was Yves Regan, uh, a French Jesuit who was worked in the Rich Institute in Macau, in, sorry, in, in Taipei. Um, and on in 1970, on my international research trip during my doctoral studies, I uh, spent a couple of weeks in Taiwan, and they were mostly with Yves Regan, who uh, took us on a tour of um, uh, monasteries and so on, introduced me to Buddhist abbots and Taoist um, priests and, and so on. And uh, his great work was introducing Chinese um, spiritual techniques, meditation, and so on, uh, to a Western Christian audience, and persuading them that you, they had a lot to learn from from the relig religious experience of, uh, of China. And I read his works, of course, but even more kept in touch with him. Um, and uh, was very influenced by, by his approach, more perhaps in relation to my teaching in, on Chinese religion in my British studies courses than, than in anything else, but a, a very inspiring man, a real, real charismatic, um, uh, modern Ricci, if you like. <laughs> but, uh, and of course, what he's, he used to constantly say, it's a great pity that Matteo Ricci got so hooked on Confucianism. He should have been looking at Buddhism and Taoism because that's where religion really, really lies in China. I mean, he didn't say that Confucianism didn't have religious aspects, but um, he felt that that a wrong direction had been taken very early in the, the Jesuit mission, focusing entirely on Confucianism and neglecting the treasure, spiritual treasures of uh, of uh, uh, other Chinese religious traditions. And uh, that certainly had an influence on, on my work, my research work, but also my teaching, perhaps more, more than anything else. Um, 
but that the main development that's occurred in recent years is undoubtedly that uh, scholarly and personal interaction between Chinese scholars and Western scholars of Chinese religion, Chinese Christianity, and uh, a whole lot of institutions now have uh, uh, developed those connections and maintain them. Whether they'll continue to be maintained is, of course, another matter. Um, financial, the financial crisis has followed on the pandemic has had a, a very bad effect already on on those institutions that I know about, and uh, I fear it might do more. And of course, the political developments in China itself are very unfavourable to the um, uh, the sort of cooperative study of religion that um, and religious history and Christianity in particular. Um, the uh, you know, neo Maoist um, trend in China has not been been helpful. I fear that it will undermine a lot of a lot of the work that's been done. But the personal collections that have been created will, I hope, remain, and some degree of of uh, international connection, despite the the increasingly bleak political landscape. You know, uh, Professor Rule, you mentioned uh, this, this question of connections is very fascinating. You mentioned Father Malatesta, yes. who really believed, as you mentioned, in this project of connecting Chinese scholars to Western scholars. And, you know, just by way of, a, a, I think, an, an announcement or some, something that you might find uh, pleasant to hear about, as we meet now through, uh, you know, through Zoom, uh, just recently, the Ricci Institute had uh, 60 some scholars gathered together through this medium. Many yes, of them were in yes, mainland yes. China exchanging ideas. So yes, Father yes. Malatesta's vision um, now is it's does it require uh, it doesn't require a, a, a long airline flight. <laughs> yes. No, I. I yeah. Um, certainly. Um, electronic connection <laughs> uh, will survive, uh, I think, and 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 uh, uh, connections already made can be continued through through that means. I remember uh, in 1982, I spent a summer, an Australian summer, teaching at East China Normal University in Shanghai. And um, I, uh, I made some effort to make contact with uh, the history of the Jesuits in Shanghai, which was, had always interested me. But um, uh, mostly I was teaching Australian studies, which is rather strange. Um, um, the only audience of students that I've ever had weep at something that I spoke to them, a lecture was in Shanghai at East China Normal University when I spoke about black literature in Australia, Aboriginal literature, the literature on uh, the breaking up of families, of children being taken from their parents and so on, uh, which was just starting to, to really boom in Australia at that time. And I found some of the girls in my class in particular were actually weeping <laughs> as I read bits of this stuff. But um, uh, the other thing that occurred in, in that uh, exchange was a, 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 um, a first contacts that I made with, with a lot of, of Chinese scholars who are working very much within the Chinese university system. And uh, uh, that I'd learned so much from them and they'd learned it, learned it from me. Uh, and also, um, oh yes, uh, the other thing I was going to say was, I well remember speaking to a large class of 
students at the Australian Studies Centre at ECNU. Uh, and I said to them, I think your um, relationship with Australia is going to be changed enormously in the very near future through um, electronic communication, through emails and, and so on. It won't be long before you will be corresponding constantly with friends and scholars in Australia. They laughed at me, literally they laughed. I mean, it was still the aftermath of the Cultural Revolution and they couldn't imagine that this would be so, but of course it is so, has been so. There are problems as we all know about censorship and all the rest of it, but still uh, electronic communication ha on the personal level has enabled things that, uh, that uh, scholars wouldn't have imagined possible um, in an earlier period. And my hope is that uh, this is going to continue uh, through what's probably going to be some fairly fraught uh, years um, in our field in the immediate future. Right. Now, you know, that brings us to the last question. I'm, I'm looking at our time. We have about, about five more minutes. Um, and you may have actually already answered this in some way, but, uh, and this might even seem like a hackneyed question, but uh, it's a question that we want to ask, especially new scholars in our field um, are really interested to hear what your hopes are for the field. Well, um, over recent years, I've had a number of Chinese graduate students, which I wouldn't have imagined again earlier. Um, uh, even at the moment, I, um, I'm doing a little bit of supervision in the China Study Research Center at La Trobe University. It's in Chinese philosophy, certainly not, not my own field, although occasionally I give a, a seminar or presentation on something I've been working on, which the Chinese students find of interest. Um, so uh, it's at that level that I, that um, my current um, interaction has been occurring. Whether it will in the near future is another matter. I mean, it's becoming very difficult, will be very difficult, I think, for Chinese students to come so freely to study in Australia or the United States as they have before had serious consequences for the Australian universities, which have been financially propped up by large numbers of uh, Chinese undergraduate students uh, and a few graduate students. Um, but uh, who knows what's going to, to emerge. Uh, I think China will see that it's in its own interest to, um, to not to cut that off right. too radically, although they've been threatening noises about it. Um, but again, the personal contacts have been made and they presumably will, will continue and uh, should, um, you know, prove very useful. Um, electronic publication too is another, another very important field. And the publication of the documents, archival documents and so on. Uh, getting financial support for a lot of these projects is, is not so easy and will become increasingly difficult, I think, right. over the next immediate few years. But a lot has been done. And once things have been digitized, they're, they're digitized. And uh, 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 really the problem is an overwhelming mass of material which hasn't been worked on right rather than uh, uh any shortage of material as once might have been the case so uh, uh institutions are very important um research institutions and so on and uh i hope that not too many of those that i've relied on very heavily over the last 30 or 40 years are uh, uh, going to hit the wall in, through the financial mm -hmm. consequences of the pandemic. But um, uh, I think there'll be immediately 
quite serious problems, but perhaps things will sort out after a time. Mm. At least I think there is an awareness that studying Chinese missionary history is not that sort of dead end and peculiar esoteric field that uh, so many people were convinced it was um, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, no longer do you have to justify what you're doing to the mainstream of, of uh, Chinese historians. Mm -hmm. They've all found that whatever their special interest, that there is something in the missionary experience and the missionary records that is, is um, very relevant to their understanding. And since the basic problem is, of course, um, the notion of incompatible cultures and so on, uh, the very existence of what can be shown to be real friendships, real personal contacts between European individuals and Chinese individuals back in the late Ming, early Qing, and right through to the present day, that um, um, is um, something that, that I think has been uh, has come across, has been made a, a, in the awareness of, uh, of uh, most people who work on, on China. You know, Professor Rule, you, you began, um, and we're just now, just nearing the end of our time, you began talking early on uh, quite a bit about exchange and friendship and Ricci. Yes. And, um, and, and it sounds like your hopes sort of go back to that very initial sort of cogitation that you had. That is uh, a hope that we go back to exchange or that we can continue this exchange especially in the scholarly realm. And I'm also conscious of the comment that you made about the difference between looking at a digital image and holding in your hand. I remember the yes. first time I was in the presence of an original letter by Matteo Ricci at Rome. Yeah. And there was something about, about the letter being, you know, in my hand <laughs> that yes, made it yes, very, indeed, yeah. very different and very real. I also remember the last time I saw you in in person was in 2017, I believe, in Berkeley. Oh, yes, yes. Yes. So um, as we end, uh, I, I just want to say I hope that, uh, I hope that the, the, the next time we meet or, or that we meet in the future uh, in, 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 in person, I hope personally that would be um, the case. I want to take this opportunity to thank you personally for your lifetime of work. Um, not often do we get to thank the people that, of, about whom's work or with whom's work we cite in our own. So um, I just want to personally thank you for your, your work in this field. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, and just, um, again, thank you for agreeing to be interviewed. This, this really was an honor and a very a priv a special privilege for me. So thank you so much. Good. Thank you. I've, I've enjoyed the conversation and enjoyed the opportunity. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Professor Rule.